Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Metrics meeting. Thank you all for coming. Um, our agenda for today, we're going to start with um, our usual welcomes and anniversaries. Um, then we're going to have a strategy update from Lila, um, a community update from Lewis, um, a research presentation from uh, John Morgan, and a uh, product demo from, um, from who again? <laughs> Dimitri Brandt, that's who. That's who. Thank you for reminding me. Um, and then we're going to close with a Q&A. So first things first, um, welcome to our new hires, uh, Liz Lard in uh, Talent and Culture, Lindsay Ann Frankenfield in, uh, over in Editing, um, Aaron Palmer in Legal, and Joe Matazzoni um, also in Editing. Um, and then we have new... And we are also welcoming Jessica Lagarde and Adnan and Ivia Shah patients. And we have some anniversaries to celebrate as well. Um, Anna has been with us for five years. <laughs> and our other anniversaries are Max and UV for four years. Um, Matt Flash and Katie Love for three years. Moyes, Nuria, Shara, and David Chan for three years, and um, T. Marco, Mirza, and Maria for three years. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and with that, I will hand it to Lila for a strategy update. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, very, uh, very brief strategy update today. As you remember, about a month ago, uh, in the last uh, metrics meeting, I put in front of you the three key pillars of the strategy. But since then, you've given me a lot and a lot of feedback. So I've taken that feedback, and uh, here's what I've, uh, I've bucketed it into two major areas. Uh, and um, most of the requests basically came in asking for, one, more transparency. The lack of visibility into the process and collaboration with the process um, created uh, some of, a lot of confusion. And so in, in, if we increase transparency, increase collaboration, we'll, uh, we should reduce the confusion about the process, the process, and ultimately the outcome of the strategy that we want. So that's one of the things that we're going to address, and we have started on that path already. The second one has to do with more focus in the strategy. Because we're such a large movement, and we have so many opportunities, we can really do so many different things. And that makes it really hard for us to make decisions. So what I heard from you, what you said to me, is the strategy when we put it together needs to be, uh, needs to enable us to make some decisions and make those decisions clearly and at every level within uh, the organization. It also needs to be obviously aligned with, uh, with our vision and with the current and urgent needs of our users. So what have we done so far? On the transparency front, we've actually made some, uh, some movement already. We've set up and met with the collaborative platypus team. Those of you who have volunteered for it, thank you so much. You already have provided guidance, and we're going to be coming back to you for more. Um, Maggie, a special thank you to you for uh, drafting a possible strategy process, and Kevin for helping us move forward. And, uh, we took that process and we evaluated possible timelines that this process may take. Then, at the group, you, the Platypus team, those of you who have participated, decided to place, uh, place that process on meta. Place is important. It needs to be public, it needs to be visible, it needs to be easy for everybody to participate from different projects. So that, that has been decided. I have spoken with a possible strategy consultant who can help us through the collaborative process uh, in the next uh, in the next quarter, if we decide to have uh, have help like that, um, if we decide to go that route, a few of you will speak with her and interview her and make sure this is the right uh, right course of action. 
Finally, uh, determining which process to follow, really, uh, really important as well, and this is something that we need to make a decision on and move forward. There are two possibilities. Um, some of you already know, one is a long process, it will take 12 months and give us a lot of details and, and tactics. And another one is a, is a shorter process that will give us strategic direction, including our top priority goals, which each one of your teams can then take and build your own priorities and your own project plans against. So that's, uh, that would distribute it to your teams and give you the ability to make the decisions. So on the guiding focus, what's next on that front? There is, uh, as, as you remember, the three pillars, and these are actually the same pillars that you see in the previous strategy, or similar, very, very similar ones, is reach, community, and knowledge. And of course, all of those are fundamental to our movement overall, to, uh, to what we do. We can't neglect any one of those. But from perspective of the WMF as a part of the overall movement, as our organization, we need to decide where we can make the most impact and really create a guiding focus in that area. And that is something that we're going to need to do in the next couple of weeks. So what are our next step? we need steps? We need to choose the, that top level priority. We need to get it, get it done by the, next, by the end of the year. That, that will help us all make choices and set priorities. That is true to our vision. Is where we as an organization, as a WMF, can make the most impact. Uh, and is, of course, focused on our, uh, on our users' needs. Where is the most urgent user need today? And in parallel, we need to start planning the community consultation, and that's the work that the Platypus team is doing, that the consultation will take place in Q3 to make sure that the community, we have full participation around actually building collaboratively and transparently strategic goals against the top priority. So that's where we're at. I wanted to give you this update. I wanted to, uh, to let you know um, what changes we have put into place to, um, to help respond to some of the feedback. And uh, here's the timeline for getting it completed. Thank you. <laughs> Who is? I, I, oh, but yes, this. Um, so while we are uh, continuing, let me, is this my right mark? Awesome. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the world outside these walls continues on without us. Um, you know, while we're uh, very correctly focused on things like uh, fundraising and, and strategy. Uh, so here's a quick glimpse into that. Uh, the Wikisource conference, uh, some of you may have heard about this in the past uh, few weeks. Uh, the Wikisource community uh, together for the first time ever as an independent community uh, funded in part through our grant making process to talk about uh, to talk about the future of Wikisource, right? Um, this is something, as many of you know, it's a project that has some very passionately involved people, um, has some great support, um, but hasn't always necessarily, uh, you know, ha hasn't had the kind of growth you would like to see. So they wanted to talk, uh, so they wanted to get together and talk, and they, uh, by all accounts, it sounds like they had a really good conference. They had external partners helping to give them uh, context about how those partners might use it. They talked specifically about identity and mission. Our, our own Asaf helped to drive that conversation. They talked about the technical needs of Wikisource. Some of you in product will be seeing some wish listy kinds of stuff out of that, and I think we'll be having some interesting discussions about how we can help support that. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that we support because we feel uh, that it helps that getting the right people in a room physically together, uh, IRC and talk pages are awesome, um, but this kind of thing can really help uh, set a community on the right path for the long run, right, by getting and building those face-to-face -face bonds. And I'm pretty excited to see what comes out of it in the coming uh, weeks and months. Many of you here in the office saw this, but for those of you out on the stream, we had the stewards in uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a picture of, I think not all of them, I think uh, several of them had left or didn't want their uh, photo seen, but 
we discussed again, uh, you know, I mean, the folks are, 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 are careful about their identities. A lot of talks about how uh, we can support them technically. A lot of talks about how they can improve their own internal workflows, which I thought was really interesting, right? It was also, I have to admit, sort of interesting si simply uh, watching some of them walk through the workflows, the complexity. I sort of knew abstractly how complex some of these workflows were, um, but it was really fun for me to see them uh, in person. Uh, again, the bonds that are formed with these kinds of things are really important for us, so I was really glad to see them here in the office, and we'll be thinking about how we can do more of these. We did, um, as some of you know, we do a feedback survey every year uh, to see, you know, speaking of showing that these events matter, uh, we'll, we do a feedback survey every year, and uh, this year we did, uh, we got some pretty cool numbers out of it, right? Um, a huge number of people uh, agreed that it was helping them gain knowledge from others. Critically, um, do I get the, uh, oh yeah, I actually get a laser pointer here. Um, a huge number of them made new connections that they feel are going to help them uh, work in their projects uh, over time. Things that were, uh, unfortunately I realize we have two spelling errors in the names here, but uh, <laughs> the uh, favorite sessions uh, to come out of it were Bringing Free Education to the World. Many of you saw this. It was a keynote uh, by Louis von Ahn, uh, who's done a lot of really interesting, uh, and to me, it was a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, My Life as an Autistic Wikipedian by uh, Guillaume, uh, which uh, I didn't get to go to, but for those of you who have not read it, there's an essay version of it online. It's powerful and imp important, and you should read it. Um, and a fun one, the coolest projects of Wikimedia chapters, right, showing to each other what they're doing. Um, you know, we uh, were also, we did this survey in part to feed into an upcoming consultation on what Wikimania is, why we're doing it, how we can improve it in the future. Uh, keep an eye, as some of you will have seen on Wikimedia L just this morning, we're aiming to, uh, to take that live in mid-December and run it through January, so keep an eye out for that. This is a fun one. So uh, John Cornyn, senator, uh, U.S. senator over there, I don't agree with all his politics, but you know, um, he uh, there was uh, his article had some stuff he didn't like on it. He reached out to Wikimedia DC. Uh, you can imagine a whole lot of different ways that this could have gone. Uh, Wikimedia DC ran with it and turned it into something really awesome, right? They uh, worked with the senator staff to simply educate about how Wikipedia works, how it can be improved. Um, and they're working now on planning, hopefully, a uh, education senate, uh, an education session for all of the Wikimedia staff, right? Uh, for all, of, sorry, for all of the Senate staff, Wikimedia staff, hopefully, shouldn't need it. Um, and that's the kind, uh, you know, I think this is a really great example. We, I talked in the last slide about how one of the most popular talks at Wikimania was people seeing what other chapters were doing. This is the kind of great thing that can scale across a lot of. Uh, a lot of places and a lot of governments, right? We know the local chapters like to talk to government, like to, like to educate. We've seen similar things happen, uh, for example, off the top of my head in Italy. I think it's a, you know, this is the kind of thing where boots on the ground do things that we as WMF can't necessarily do. Uh, another example of the kinds of things we can't necessarily do, cross-chapter collaborations. You all have seen me talk a few times about uh, Ibero Co-op, uh, and the Central and Eastern European group where folks are working with each other, helping each other out. Uh, we've got a couple new examples of that. I think it's a really interesting and growing area of community collaboration, right? The examples here are German-speaking uh, and Serbia and Bulgaria, um, you know, working together on projects of shared interest, which I think is a great way for them to multiply their impact, which is an important theme for all of us. Finally, a couple of fun uh, milestones. Uh, Ukrainian Wikipedia, uh, how many of you have edited in the middle of a civil war? <laughs> nope, nope, nope. <laughs> For those of you who couldn't hear, Lisa said she feels like she's doing that every day. Um, <laughs> uh, however, the Ukrainian Wikipedia has been doing amazing stuff of late. Despite what's been going on, uh, you know, in in that country, 600,000 articles, which I think is amazing. So a big round of applause for them. Um, 
and, you know, and that's on the big end of the scale, on, on the small but still impactful end of the day scale. Some of you have heard some of your coworkers talk about 100 wiki days before uh, an initiative where people just commit to write a new article every day for 100 days, right? Um, on the one hand, it sounds really small, but on the other hand, it's 4,000 new articles that have been created, right? At least some of them with the help of the new content translation tool. So we have both these big picture numbers, uh, you know, big active Ukrainian community, and also, uh, you know, smaller groups of people taking their own initiative and turning out some uh, pretty cool articles. So I'm, I admit I'm never going to write 100 articles in 100 days, but one of these days maybe I'll get to at least 100 edits in 100 days, and that, you know, Hopefully, it will be a fun milestone and, and something that I think everybody in this room could uh, could easily do as well. So, on that note, I will uh, pass it off to research. Uh, I don't. Uh, Brennan, is that your switch? Yes. JMO. JMO, we love you. Hey, Lewis, how's it going? Can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Um, so I think that. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and that way, let's see, that's not what I want to share. That way I can read my notes while I talk to y'all. All right, can everybody see the research slide? Yes. Perfect. All right, I'm Jonathan Morgan with the design research team. Today I'm going to share a story uh, with a happy ending with you. It's a true story about editor retention, collaboration, community health, and about what it feels like to be a Wikipedia newbie. It's also about a place called the Tea House. You're probably already familiar with the general background of this story. In order for Wikipedia to survive, a relatively small percentage of the people who read the encyclopedia need to try editing it, and a relatively small percentage of those people need to continue editing regularly for months or years. Unfortunately, while our readership has grown, the percentage of people who try to edit and the percentage of those people who go on to become Wikipedians has been shrinking over the past eight years. In part, this is because there is a steep learning curve to becoming an editor. You need to learn how to use the technology and how to play by the rules, both of which are rather idiosyncratic. Another reason is that new editors are increasingly having negative experiences when they try to participate. Their articles get deleted, their edits reverted, and their user talk pages rapidly fill up with stern warnings from people they've never met. Even good faith newcomers who are trying their best are likely to be reverted, warned, and even blocked for mistakes they probably didn't know they were making. All right, so that's the background. The Tea House, which, which I'm going to talk about today, is an attempt to address some of these issues and thereby increase the number of newcomers who stick around and work on the encyclopedia. The Tea House is a populated, user-friendly help space designed to provide peer support and positive experiences for new editors. When they visit the Tea House, new editors can get answers to their questions, experience friendly encouragement, and, and learn about the community behind the encyclopedia. The Tea House was created in early 2012 as a fellowship project aimed at increasing new editor retention with a specific focus on narrowing the gender gap by recruiting and retaining more women editors. Although the Tea House was launched with foundation support, it has been entirely community run for the past three years, during which, which it has served more than 8,000 new editors. The type of service it provides is reflected in a set of features that serve as the foundation for the Tea House model. First and foremost, the Tea House provides a question and answer forum. Here's an example of a question thread from last week. In this thread, a new editor, Kat Brewer, asks how to add sources in order to keep an, ar an article they've created from being deleted. Kat Brewer receives prompt and friendly responses from three experienced editors, called Tea House hosts, who go out of their way to explain how to add sources, as well as the importance of reliable sources. One of them even helps the newcomer by editing the article directly. The Q&A forum was created before we had Flow, so it uses a simple gadget that allows new editors to participate in discussions without having to edit wiki text. In addition to a Q&A forum, 
The Wikipedia Tea House provides a page where new editors can create public profiles, sharing a little about who they are and why they're on Wikipedia. Guests can also view profiles created by their volunteer hosts. These are three of our longest standing hosts. When a Wikipedian decides to become a Tea House host, they agree to live up to a few basic expectations. They agree to welcome everyone, to be polite and patient with new editors and, keep e and with each other, to keep their answers simple and easy to understand, and to answer questions directly rather than simply linking to a bunch of policies. They also agree to notify new users that they've responded to their question, since many new editors aren't familiar with concepts like watch lists and page histories yet. These expectations are not rules. Hosts aren't required to follow them, and there are no consequences if they don't. The final piece of the Tea House model is direct outreach. Rather than sitting back and hoping new editors find their way to the Tea House, we send a bot to place a friendly invite message on their talk page. So that's the basic Tea House strategy for engaging and supporting new editors. In order to determine whether that strategy worked as advertised, in mid-2012, the original Tea House team launched a set of surveys with Tea House guests and hosts. Survey results like these here suggested to the team that the Tea House was providing value to new editors. These two responses from our survey show that new editors appreciated the quality of the information they received, as well as the overall experience. Respondents remarked on the welcoming atmosphere, the ease of use, feeling encouraged, and feeling like part of a community. We also found that a lot of female newcomers were participating in the Tea House at about twice the rate we expected, suggesting that the Tea House was especially valuable for underserved and underrepresented populations. But the pilot project was too short for us to definitively answer our main question. Does the Tea House encourage more editors to stick around and become Wikipedians? Fortunately, a few months ago, Aaron and I had the opportunity to start trying to answer this question. Even more fortunately, the Tea House has prospered under community leadership over the intervening years, so the answer was of more than purely academic interest. We designed a controlled A-B test to evaluate the impact of being invited to the Tea House on a new editor's likelihood of surviving as a Wikipedian. Our data set consisted of 14,000 new editors. 11,000 of these editors had been invited to the Tea House. 3,000 of them could have been invited, but the invite was intentionally held back. That's our control group. For both groups, the criteria for receiving an invitation were the same. The editors had made at least five edits in the first couple days after registration. They hadn't received any red flag talk page warnings or been blocked from editing. So we could be reasonably sure that they weren't vandals. We examined how many edits each editor in our sample made during the three, week, three windows of time after the invite date. Three to four weeks later, one to two months later, or two to six months later. And we counted how many people in each group had made at least one edit during each of these periods, and how many people had made five or more edits. We found that a higher percentage of editors in the Tea House invitee sample met our one in five edit criteria across all three time points. For two of the conditions, the difference between invitees and control editors was statistically significant. So in other words, we saw more invitees making edits across the board, but only in two of those cases could we be 95% sure that the increases we were seeing were more than random chance. In the other cases, we could only be 80 to 94% sure, which is pretty good, but not enough for science. So I'll focus on the findings we're most certain about. Three to four weeks later, 10% more Tea House invitees made at least one edit, compared to those poor neglected editors in the control group. Two to six months out, the picture is even brighter. 16% more Tea House invitees were making five or more edits. They crossed some invisible threshold and were much more likely now to continue editing for months and years to come. Now, a 16% increase may not sound like a huge deal immediately, but it's actually pretty exceptional. And here's why. New editor retention has been a recognized issue within our community and a high priority for a long time. There have been quite a few foundation and community-led initiatives focused on this problem, but we have traditionally struggled to show positive proof of impact. 
So it's especially exciting and inspiring, to me anyway, that a joint initiative of the Wikimedia Foundation and the English Wikipedia community has been successful at retaining new editors. Part of that impact is probably due to the design of the Tea House, the Tea House model I talked about earlier. But I credit the participatory design process by which the Tea House was created for its ability to sustain its positive impact over time. So there are many ways to do participatory design. Uh, here's how it shook out in this case. The team proposed the project on the wiki. We got approval to experiment with solutions to the problem we had framed. We involved editors early in the design and development, and we iterated on our design in public. We evaluated the success of the pilot project against our stated goals, and then we disseminated the results as far and wide as we could. At the end of our pilot, we quietly stepped back and let the community take over, offering support when needed. Over the past few years, we've seen the English Wikipedia community become more and more invested in the Tea House. This chart shows growth in the number of links to the Tea House from user talk pages over time, as Tea House links have been included in welcome templates and as more editors have gotten involved in reaching out to new editors in need. The Tea House has become an important part of the overall wiki ecology. Ultimately, though, a 16% increase in retention isn't enough. Every year, fewer and fewer people try to become editors of English Wikipedia. And we can't maintain the quality of the 5 million articles we have, let alone continue to create the articles we need, without retaining a larger, more diverse set of new editors. And we can't forget our other encyclopedias and sister projects, many of which also struggle with editor retention for similar reasons. With that in mind, here, here are a couple of examples of how we could scale this success to support more new editors better. Since the success of the Tea House is at least as much about people as it is about technology, my first example focuses on programmatic work. The Tea House was only able to get off the ground because of a dedicated team of staff and volunteers who shepherded it during its early days. Other successful, self-sustaining programs within the Wikimedia movement, like GLAM, Wikiloves, and the Education Program, have also followed this, this general pattern. A movement-wide Tea House program could support Wikimedia projects that want to build on Wiki new editor support tools of their own. It would help local partners organize their community around the initiative, deploy the necessary tools, and customize their Tea House to suit their local wants and needs and possibly even assist them in using the Tea House as a launch pad for other editor engagement initiatives. We can also build on the success of the Tea House as a product and incorporate aspects of the Tea House model into other editor-facing products and features. Here are two examples. Unfortunately, most new editors don't get to benefit from the Tea House because they abandon Wikipedia before they get an invitation. The vast majority of people who make one or two edits never edit again. Currently, we don't invite people to the Tea House until we can re be reasonably sure that they're not going to be hostile or disruptive. Unfortunately, that has meant waiting until they'd survived in the icy waters of Wikipedia for 24 to 48 hours before inviting them, because we don't have a crystal ball that lets us tell a good editor from a bad one just by looking at a couple edits. Fortunately, we will soon have a way to do precisely that, thanks to another foundation community collaboration. The rev scoring system that was announced this week will make it much easier for us to distinguish between a good faith newcomer who is struggling and a vandal who is intent on messing things up, even after just a few edits. So we can reach many more valuable new editors sooner before they give up without attracting vandals to the tea house or wasting volunteers time. However, even with better tools for identifying new good faith newcomers early, we still won't be able to serve every new editor who needs help. The Tea House is a finite resource. There are only so many hosts. We can't bring 5,000 people a day to a single wiki project. And we can't effectively support our increasingly mobile first new editor base this way. So how do we offer a Tea House-like experience to every new editor? One way to do that could be to provide self-service Q&A. 
This is kind of like how new programmers use sites like Stack Overflow. You think of a question, you type it into a search box, find that 10 other new programmers have asked similar questions, and then you scan through the results to find the best answer. There are currently 12,000 questions in the T-House archive, and more are added every day. We know that those questions have high quality, detailed answers, and that they're phrased the way newcomers would phrase them. We also know that they're more likely to be up to date and easy to understand than help documentation. We could use Elasticsearch to make these questions and answers easy to query and provide this functionality via a simple gadget that we activate by default for every new editor. Anyway, those are just a couple examples of how I think we might be able to build on this project. I'll wrap up this talk with a couple lessons that I've learned along the way as I've worked on the Tea House, both in a fellow and in a volunteer capacity. The Tea House reminds me every day that our projects are living systems. Each wiki is a densely interconnected complex of software, content, and people. Building within such a system affords certain opportunities, and it also presents particular challenges. At our best, we in the Wikimedia Foundation have been good faith collaborators with our volunteer communities and responsible stewards of software, content, and community health. And we've had many awesome successes, not just the Tea House. So I want to close by inviting you to think of other successes, big and small, that you've experienced or witnessed during your time in the foundation and in the Wikimedia movement, and to reflect on what we can learn from those successes and how we can use what we've learned to play our role even better. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, if we have a couple of minutes, um, my collaborator, Aaron Halfacre, and I are happy to uh, answer questions. <laughs> we're, uh, on, yeah, we're actually doing questions at the end. Oh, um, cool. Well, in that case, thank you. So next up, we have uh, Dimitri Brandt, uh, who's going to do a product demo. Hey everyone, Dimitri here. Um, I'm an engineer on the mobile apps team, and I'm the product owner for the Android app. And we just wanted to highlight a few new things that we've been working on in our Android world. Um, and what I'll show is actually pretty similar to a lightning talk that I did a couple weeks ago. So sorry if I'm repeating myself to those of you who watched that talk. This looks like a slightly bigger audience than the Lightning Talk audience, so I think I'm good. Um, let me just shuffle some things around. And there we are. So the Android team has been pretty busy this quarter. Uh, one very important thing to mention is the new content service that we've been working on, the, uh, the content service that's built on top of RESTBase and Parsoid, and that's what the app is now using. Um, without getting too technical about this, the goal of the content service is to return the article content uh, but also augment it with you know, all kinds of useful metadata about the article and structure it in a way that makes it really easy for the app to consume it in a single transaction. Uh, and not just our app, but any other client that might want this kind of data. And I'll just touch on the rationale for this. Um, as we started adding you know, more and more nice features to the app, what we found was that many of these features were requiring us to make additional network transactions to get all the information about the article that we couldn't otherwise get easily from just the article contents. So like, here's an example. Uh, we show lead images at the top of articles in the app. Well, in order to do that, we need the URL to get the proper resolution of this image for this device. But then we also need the URL for a smaller version of that image to go to serve as a thumbnail for this history list that we have here. So 
It used to be that we need to make separate requests to get those URLs, whereas now, with the service, it can give us multiple resolutions of the image in one go, which makes this a bit faster and more efficient. Uh, another different example here, if, for example, an article has a recorded audio pronunciation of the title, like this one does here, the service can just provide the, the URL for that audio recording instead of us having to hunt it down in the HTML of the article. So all we need to do is drop that URL into a native component like we have there and just have it work seamlessly. You'll just, you'll have to trust me that when I press that button I hear a voice in my head saying Titan. Uh, <laughs> another one of our newish features is link previews. So when you tap on a link in the article, you get a little preview of that link. So the idea is that you get the short excerpt of that article as well as a, a little gallery of images related to the article. And uh, more often than not, this would provide enough context for you that you don't need to move on to the full article to understand what it's about. Uh, of course, you can continue to the full article if you want to read it all the way through. But, you know, this way, what we're trying to do is encourage you to not be shy in clicking as many links as you want and you know, just get the gist of them um, while being sure to not lose your place in the article that you were reading originally. That's the key. And so once again, thanks to the content service we're building, these link previews can be even faster and more efficient because it's combining all these bits of information into a single uh, response. So we can see that these link previews are pretty much as performant as they can be on this Android device. I know it probably looks a little choppy over the Hangout, but uh, on my physical device here, it's, it's totally smooth. So also, as we speak, uh, we're working on developing you know, additional features um, that expose and bring together more content. Like, for example, we're working on integrating with Wiktionary. You'll be able to highlight any word in the article, and it'll automatically pop up a little uh, short definition of the term from Wiktionary. We thought it would be a pretty natural combination of the two projects to be able to surface Wiktionary content like that. Um, another thing, if you go to an article that has a, a geolocation associated with it, like a city or a place, you'll have a button that will be able to pinpoint this article on a map or even give you directions to it. Uh, and all of this is, once again, uh, done through the content service. So the Android team has been sort of owning the sort of service. service. Our, 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 we'll get some echo there. And we're actually just in the process of rolling this out to a percentage of our beta audience to see how the service performs under increasing load. But our hope is that a lot of other consumers can start benefiting from it, like other native apps or any kind of future web applications and so on. Um, and I was just mentioning maps and pinpoints, wasn't I? So the one other thing I wanted to highlight is our new nearby screen. So uh, previously, the app had a nearby feature, uh, but all it was was a list of articles that happened to be nearby your location or like near the GPS position of your device. But now, when you tap on nearby, you get a full-blown map with pinpoints on articles nearby you. And uh, in case you're wondering, this is using our very own Wikimedia tile server, running OpenStreetMaps. Uh, you can pan and zoom this, and you can rotate it however you like. And when you move to a new location, the collection of markers gets updated. And when you tap on a marker, you get the same kind of link preview that we saw when we tap on regular links in an article. Very simple. Um, and really, 
we should probably stop calling this nearby at this point because really you're able to zoom out as far as you like and go to a different part of the world. We can try to zoom in anywhere we want. Let's see what's going on here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And actually, uh, this can even work without the location permission that you usually have to grant to apps when you install them. You know, in the new version of Android, you can selectively grant permissions to apps. And even if you deny the, uh, the permission location to our app, this would still work. It, would, it just wouldn't show your location in relation to these markers. But that's all. It would work. Uh, so we're actually deploying this to production or to the Play Store next week, end of next week at the latest. So yeah, this is the new nearby. Um, so anyway, I think that should do it for now. So yeah, if you have an Android device and still don't have the Wikipedia app installed, you're missing out. And I say that without any kind of bias or ulterior motive. But seriously, do install the app, tell your friends, and we welcome all your feedback. Thank you. All right, that concludes our presentations for today. Um, I'd like to invite um, Lila and Lewis um, back up front um, to answer questions, and people can pose questions to the remote presenters as well. Um, people locally here in the SF office, please line up by the question mic over there, and um, people attending remotely can ask questions in IRC. Um, speaking of that, James, do we have questions from IRC already? Hello. Yes, excellent. I have uh, several questions, none of which are this microphone. Ah, there we go. Um, so the first question is for Lila, it's from Aaron. Um, why are we so concerned about focus? How do we balance focus and long-term planning with opportunities and adaptability? I think there are two questions in there. Um, I think focus is working. Okay, good. I think um, there are a couple of reasons why we want focus. Um, the range of possibilities of what we can do and the range of opportunity that we have is enormous. And if you look back, if we look back at our previous strategic plan, one of the things that we see is that because it was uh, hitting every single um, criteria kind of on the list, it was really hard for us to deliver on all of them. So focus would provide us with uh, with our uh, with ability to test and concentrate on impact in, in a particular area. And I think there's, there was a second part of the question. How do we uh, balance the focus on long-term planning with like agility, uh, opportunities, and adaptability? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so focus should provide us with, think of it as a direction. But how you get to that direction is, uh, is going to be up to uh, every different team. And when we speak about focus, we're talking about the three pillars. With, we're saying, do, should we focus more? Can we impact more our reach, our ability to reach every human being? Can we impact more uh, what we can do for our community editors and increase the number of editors? Should, should that be, uh, sh is that where we can have the most impact? Or can we have the most impact on the actual knowledge that we produce? And when we think about that, you know, it's when, when whether you pick one or the other, the actual stra detailed strategies and tactics and experimentation that needs to go in there, that's going to be up to our teams to do in collaboration with the community. Okay. Uh, next question. Actually, can I elaborate? Let me elaborate on that one just a little bit. Um, I, I was actually uh, we when we were interviewing a CFO candidate, he asked about uh, how you know you all have so many opportunities. How how do you decide, right? And I think for me as the leader of a department, um, it you know some narrowing focus a little bit. Uh, helps us choose, I mean, literally with all the different opportunities we have to do work with our communities, 
I could have a staff of 500 people just in my department, right? Product could be a few thousand. Um, we need to have, <laughs> yeah, don't anybody get any ideas. Uh, and if I gave Lisa a stroke, I apologize. Um, uh, you know, and, and so a, a good strategy tells you not just what your opportunities are, but also tells you how to prioritize them, right? So that, so that given the limited resources we do have, and given the, the limited resources we will have, um, you know, that, that helps us narrow down and do a few things really well rather than being scattered and doing a lot of things uh, you know, inconsistently, right? So I, that's really, I, I'm looking forward to that, certainly, as a, as a leader in the group, so. I uh, spoiled the question I'm next going to ask by giving to you an answer already. Um, what does the procedure for communicating with German-speaking people or whatever the chapter slide said mean exactly? Um, so uh, the unfortunately the answer to that is actually I am not entirely sure uh, that was uh, actually um, uh, added to the slides uh, fairly last minute and I unfortunately don't have the detail there but I will find that out I know uh, as a general matter uh, especially the uh, the German chapter has been experimenting a lot with how they get information out of their communities uh, so that they can turn it into actionable information, right? So for example, they've been uh, doing a lot in the tech uh, work, which our community tech team has also been working with them to learn uh, from what from what they've done there. So um, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a more specific answer on that one. Uh, I'm usually, usually pretty on top of the details in these slides, but, but this week you caught me out. Any questions from the room or? I've got a whole bunch. Oh boy. Okay, uh, Jamo, um, I've got four questions for you, uh, <laughs> uh, and I will leave mine own to last. Um, so the first one from uh, Joe S. Isn't it unfair to not invite potentially great editors to the tea house just so they might troll group for this study? Yeah, no, I, I, I felt really conflicted about that. That's why the control group was so much smaller than the experimental group. Um, it actually impacted our ability to make claims. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of things that we failed to get significance on by just a hair that I believe we would be able to get significance on and learn more if we had uh, a bigger control group. Um, so we're actually doing it again. Uh, so to get to the original, you know, kind of the I don't know the the personal, moral, or broader ethical question of it. Um, this this was uh, this was done. Um, on a volunteer basis, um, it was not part of uh, my work for the foundation. Um, the data was that were actually collected uh, last year um, and not for this particular purpose. And um, I think it's a total shame. Um, but at the same time, I believe that if uh, showing that the Tea House has a positive impact on editor retention um, allows us to uh, Scale the tea house, or make it, you know, get that get the word out there. Then um, it's worthwhile. Hello, Abby. Hello. I was just wondering if it's possible to, after the experiment is done, send send them send them invites afterwards. Ship is is generally sailed by that point. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, next up is from Ori. Um, you said the tea house is at least as much about people as it is about technology. How do you know? The tea house treatment is many things an invitation to participate, a safe space, a chance to ask questions and get answers, a portal to the Wikipedia adventure, an opportunity to attach a place in a biographical blurb to other editors, and so on. How can we scale it unless we know which properties of the tea house are responsible for the effect observed? So I'll make one answer and then I'll give it to Aaron because he has some other. He has some other answers to this. So first part is um, we have a lot. We get, gained a lot of insight from our survey data into what aspects of the tea house um, were um, were engaging particular sets of participants or found that people found most helpful. Um, and then there's some other analysis that we can run, and Aaron can give a quick answer to that. Yeah, so I think that this this point is really critical, uh, especially as we consider how how we extend technologies. We really need to know how to um, uh, 
sorry, I'm getting a ton of pings all of a sudden, I'm making sure uh, it seems that somebody's adjusting my audio level. <laughs> Um, anyway, we really need to know what aspects of the, the interventions that we're doing actually work so that we can have, uh, uh, we can move in the direction that will have a more significant impact. And this requires that we build theory about what's actually going on. JMO and I are invested very heavily in a research program to explore who the Tea House benefits, uh, when, when receiving the invitation has the biggest impact, and what other effects receiving different messages have. And so we've already got some preliminary results there that we're going to present at a research showcase um, on the 16th of December. And so if you want to see our updates in, about this, then please attend that research showcase. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, this is, I, I've been waiting for, to hear um, about the results of this, so it's really, really exciting. Um, and as you mentioned, yes, of course, there's technological aspect, but the most important part is that there are editors who are nurturing uh, new incoming community members. And I'm wondering if you guys have built a model um, in terms of uh, some of the possibilities that you've um, you've identified, so for example, if we were to invite more people, or even the same amount of people, but invite them earlier, um, how much, how many more editors would we need to actually participate in, and engage with those new editors at, uh, in the Tea House, and if, if we actually have that many editors in, in, um, in our movement to support that? Well, so one, so I see two kind of two areas where you know where we have kind of where we may get blocked. One is is just the number of people who are willing to engage it as hosts, and and two is just the kind of the limits on the infrastructure of a single wiki page. Um, I don't think that we have. Uh, I don't think we we. I'm not sure if we log edit conflicts, um, but having a bunch of people asking and answering questions on one wiki page, you know, there's 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 kind of diminishing returns beyond a certain point. So if we wanted to if we wanted to scale Q and A, we'd have to either take it off wiki or have multiple forums. Um, that said, I think that it's it's certainly possible to kind of like it would be possible to uh, put together some estimates for you know how many we could reasonably scale to at you know given the current infra infrastructure. Um, just before I ask the next question, yes, we log edit files, um, but we don't do much with that, except the goes down and it changes. Um, next question, uh, Mariel asked uh, Jamo again. Uh, I'm wondering, is the 16 uh, percent growth enough to also test the other goals that were mentioned for the tea house, like increasing diversity? And if so, did it? No. Um... It, it didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, in this in this study. We we didn't learn anything about the demographics um, of the participants. Um, it's other than through surveys, we don't have a good way of asking people, um, you know, personal characteristics. I think that if we if we decided that that was a a priority, that it would be possible to to combine, you know, a um, Quantitative study um, of, of editing patterns with survey research and and get a better sense of that, but we we haven't we haven't crossed those streams yet. Thanks. Okay, now I'm going to abuse my authority. I've got a question. Um, so my general question is uh, whether retention is all that important compared to, for example, helping editors be more effective or efficient or guiding editors to make better edits in the six edits they do make? Yes. <laughs> um, let's, well, so, so for, for the basic reason that, that every, every editor stops editing at some point. Um, and so there has to be a, you know, there, ha there has to be a replacement rate. Um, we have to we have to bring on new editors who who continue editing um, at the rate of the people who are naturally deciding to stop their wiki careers. Um, the other the other issue is the issue around the um, diversity or or general lack of diversity within our 
editing communities, right? Um, the, the systemic bias of our content is is directly related to the um, the interests and characteristics of the people who choose to edit. Um, and people with certain characteristics are more likely, given the current technical and social climate of Wikipedia, to stick around and become editors. Um, so we need to we need to to kind of um, remove the blockers that prevent um, otherwise valuable contributors who are underrepresented in our editing population um, from from uh, from leaving, and uh, yeah, so or, or from editing. So so really, new editor retention, particularly retention of of a more diverse set of new editors, is more important than um, than eliciting quality contribution from people who are not likely to or not otherwise inclined to become Wikipedians, I would say. You know, and one, one other note that I'd add to that is in our analyses of the results of this experiment, we actually did see that uh, not only did people survive, uh, but they also did substantially more work in the invite conditions. And so I think that, I mean, really when we're measuring this long-term survival and we're looking at productivity overall, we're sort of measuring two sides of the same thing. Is on. Yeah. So uh, one quick note about the, uh, uh, the relation between retention and diversity. Uh, it's true that we don't collect data demographics of our users, but we do have some data, for example, about uh, uh, the, the time in, in uh, when they register. And one indirect effect uh, of increasing retention of newbies, as you guys can remember from uh, uh, Neil's presentation last time, is that. Uh, by retaining this user, you're actually changing the underlying composition of the total active edit population. So by having four people who are retained after they register, it means that we try and rebalance uh, the current uh, uh, underlying graphics, which as of today, still sees most edits heavily dominated by a population of mostly registered in 2006, 2007. Okay, uh, next up, I've got a couple of quick questions for Dimitri. I'll join them together. Um, on the link preview stuff, um, have you done user testing of link preview stuff? Because uh, it's a new kind of interaction pattern, so it, you can't necessarily draw the best practices easily. And the other part of that is when you get it on iOS. Hey, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> we've, we've done uh, user testing on link previews. I think this was done at the beginning of uh, the summer. Um, and it, we've actually been collecting data on link previews after having deployed them on Android. Um, we're still sort of looking at the impact of the data and what it really means. So we're, we're still working it out. Um, and on iOS, I'm not sure when, I think Josh Miner can speak better to that if he's in the room, because he's the PO for iOS. I don't see him. OK, uh, I've got one last question uh, um, from Yuri. What's the process of deciding on our goals and priorities, and have we decided on that process? Uh, yeah, so um, one thing that we've changed based on your feedback is create is we decided to create a collaborative process. We have a proposal for that, actually a couple of them. Uh, we're going to decide in the next couple of weeks which one of those proposals to take and, and how to amend them um, together. Um, and no, we have not decided yet. We do not have a final solution on how that process is going to happen. You have some ideas. If you're part of the platform team, you probably have seen some some of the proposals. And then the next week or so, you'll see some more presentations of those. Awesome. Bobby, did you want to comment on IRS? I saw you walking. Sorry, this will be a bit of an anti context but um, we're looking at the data that Dimitri referred to um, before we roll out this feature to any of the other platforms, but uh, I'm um, In the back of what I would say. Uh, 
uh, we'll do it if, we, if our users like it. Actually, um, that's us at time, actually. It's uh, 12 o'clock. Um, so thank you, everybody, for, for coming and participating and presenting. And see you all next month in the next Metrics meeting. Thank you.